Well, hello world. Um, so I've been um, been doing a lot of thinking, and as whereas I don't really like to to talk bad about the military or anything like that, or my brothers in the CBs and, and Marine Corps and and the and the little bit of Army that I worked with, um, and a lot of SEALs and. Uh, there's a lot of crazy things that went on, especially in my second tour in um, 05, oh, well, yeah, 05, 06, and um, and with Fallujah going down and all that stuff like that, and um, and the whole, th you know, the whole part with Chris Kyle coming out and the book coming out and everything like that, and I. Uh, there was a point in time where it was like I had a bunch of guys and we were um, we were attached to the two four mu and uh, first recon and we we're in this little fob um, in Cal Su and it was right right near the Sunni Triangle and um, I think it was uh, Colonel Johnson at the time he was in charge of the two four and. We were basically tasked to come in as CBs and turn this little fob into, which also had, um, also had detainee cells there. Um, recon was stationed there. We had a small landing strip for helicopters. Um, we had a big supply yard, and when we first got there. They had one shower, and it basically was just, you know, a gigantic plastic container, you know, six, seven hundred gallons, maybe more, and it was running down through some pipes, and you just sprinkle some water on you, so it got, you know, there was porta-potties, which, you know, if you were in Iraq, you, you got really used to going to the bathroom, Either that or a wag bag, and for all you people that don't know what a wag bag is, it's basically um, a little Ziploc bag with some cat litter in the bottom of it, and you, you sat down and you took a dump in it, and when you're done, you, you threw it in, into a burn pit or a, a burn barrel and you got rid of it, and um, it's, uh, it was never fun either or, you know, um, we also had a uh, I also built the range on FOB Kelsey so we could, um, they were the recon guys and some of the other guys were training um, the Iraqi citizens to, you know, basically police themselves and actually have their own, like, military. And when they did have their own democracy and take over, that they could actually defend themselves against insurgents. And that was at best a disaster and um, these guys were all willing and able and and all that good stuff but so yeah I had all I had about 14 guys all equipment operators called mechanics and they were all the hardest workers you can possibly imagine and then we had some builders and and some other stuff so we ended up um, we ended up because we were basically eating chow right in the middle of firing zone and we got mortared all the time so like the biggest fear was either sitting on the toilet or sleeping or or sitting down eating some chow some hot chow instead of eating an MRE or something else and a mortar round come in and you're dead you know you didn't have a chance to fight or anything like that and on top of that I would me and one other guy we would go out on top of all this other work that I was coordinating and with very very little equipment we would go out and we at night times we would clear we were clear roads with a dozer and um, the funny thing is when we requested just to have just to have some 
nine mil pistols, you know, so, you know, when you're driving in the truck and all that stuff, and of course we, we didn't have the M4s back then, we were still using M16s with, um, with no, no nods, no, no red dot, no scope, no nothing, and we were driving around in basically civilian trucks with no up armor whatsoever, so, and I was hauling a big D7 high track, and sometimes we'd haul around a little JCB Bobcat that um, we would use to fill Hescos if we needed to at, at little um, checkpoints and stuff like that, because the Marines, they controlled everything. They, they patrolled, they did all that stuff, and we helped them facilitate that, and if they needed, um, if they needed a a road clear because you know a lot of you know roadside bombs you get a lot of stuff especially on the supply routes and stuff they would blow up tanker fuel tankers and everything you know everything over there ran on jp8 so you know the generators all that stuff like that there was there was no infrastructure power there's no water came from somewhere usually bottled water so it all got shipped in there wasn't like there was running water we didn't have showers they didn't have they didn't have bathroom they didn't have laundry facilities and me and my guys got there and we basically turned a swamp into a usable slash airfield for you know quick quick react stuff and you know the, the cobras there and it was it was just this tiny ass fob and we got we got mortared all the time i remember somebody did a um And I don't know where that that video is. We did a video because we we got together with a bunch of people on there. But there was this map of the base and of the the fob, and it had you literally couldn't see anywhere where a mortar round hadn't hit. And um, I, amongst everything, after I got first of all, we got we got showers up. We got brought in shower trailers. We got um, we built this huge. Um, basically bunkerized galley and somewhere on the, on the reference of like 10,000 sandbags on top of it so you could sit in it and they could bomb the hell out of it and it wouldn't matter and it was an engineering feat that the Seabees had come up with and it was amazing and they did a lot of the concrete for the floor and and all that stuff like that so amongst all that clearing roadways always being on the road you know, working seven seven days a week, you know, 19, 20 hours a day, and also trying to get my guys, you know, a little bit of downtime here and there, just just to, to decompress whatever they could, and um, simple things like getting a 9 mil for being in the truck was something they'd be like, no, you're not an officer, you don't need a 9 mil, and basically I had to instead of going through the the navy's command my own my own regiment my own battalion to get this stuff and we were in air debt i had to go through the marine corps and they were like sure here's this here's this here's that and um everywhere we turned it seemed like they didn't want us to succeed without their their own agenda and a lot of times it would be like we'd go out we'd get blown up we'd that like i wouldn't have radio communication with my my, my chain of command for 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 a week sometimes more and our co and our and our regimental um captain didn't would say I don't want my guys out there, and that that was the whole purpose of us Seabees is to, you know build and fight and move with the Marines and help them be able to do whatever they needed to do to get the job done. And in doing so, I got to see a lot of action. And but at the same time, nobody wanted us to to do that without somebody higher up having the recognition you know it wasn't about what we were doing as a whole as a CBs so much it was about 
the higher ups having something to to say, hey, this is what my guys did. At the same time, they're telling us they don't want us doing it or giving us the, the gear that we needed to do the job we had to do. And when it was all said and done, when I was like, I was, you know, I worked my guys the crazy. We moved like 800,000 cubic yards of, of gravel in, you know, in five months with a couple of civilian 15 ton dump trucks and one loader and shout out to my boy Castillo man he ran that 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 loader no up armor outside the wire he ran that thing down by the time we left there when the army came in and took everything over and then just completely shut down all all convoys all patrols all like trying to go out and find the bad guys and help th the good guys and and I know it was really hard to decipher between the two but they just wanted to occupy something without actually trying to win the war and when it was all said and done I wanted some recognition for for my boys for my guys and um, when I ran when I ran the all the stuff up through the chain of command it got shot down right away and uh, our regimental um, captain at the time she had said that nobody below a chief could get this award or nobody below this could get this award and it basically was like well I, I thought the war didn't matter about rank it mattered about what these guys were actually doing and what they were sacrificing and we would, for the most part, the whole time we were there, you didn't have any contact with your family because there wasn't a lot of infrastructure as far as being able to call home, especially on a little fob. And you were always busy or somebody would always get killed and then they would just shut off communication altogether. And it was super, super difficult. And at the end of the day, I did exactly what I had to do, and, and Colonel Johnson was really cool about that, and I was like, hey, I ran the awards to the Marine Corps for my Navy guys. Like, I ran it through them, and it, it didn't even take a week, and every one of my guys got an award, um, mostly just Navy achievement medals with with like the awesomest write-ups you could possibly imagine. I, I, I thank every day for Colonel Johnson because I had much respect for him and um, he allowed me to run my guys even though I was just, I was a, I was a newly frocked first class at the time. And um, at the end of that deployment, um, I ended up getting a Navy Com with Valor. and But I didn't want the award and I didn't write myself up for the award which I saw a lot of other first classes do but I got the award to me and um, the other thing too was you would see officers back in Fallujah where our main camp was and chiefs they were getting combat action ribbons because the whole stipulation is you had to fire your weapon and stuff. And although my guys weren't, all of them were not firing or had fired their weapon, they were all in combat. They were all taking rounds every day. They were all doing what they had to do. Not being an actual combat unit, but supporting the tip of the spear. You know, this is, this is the first recon. This is a 2-4 Mew. These guys are out there living and dying every day and we're right there with them trying to make their lives better and uh, at the end of the day <sighs> these officers that were sitting on the on Fallujah camp were it didn't matter if they fired incoming rounds and although they did that's a whole nother story about how Eric not got uh, got killed because of um, them trying to fly a flag basically for a mortar you know so they could drop mortars in on the camp and he was he was out there smoking a cigarette and he ended up he ended up catching a round and it was terrible and a lot of other of my friends got hurt in that but you have these chiefs and officers getting combat action ribbons and these awards 
for sitting on a camp and not doing what they were supposed to be doing, which was taking care of the enlisted and the people underneath them. But they were reaping all the awards. And at the end of that deployment, we were all so tired. And I had a, I had hurt my knee and I hurt my shoulder. And I ended up having um, I ended up having surgery after that after fighting for somebody to actually look at. So I was I was going around with like my knee completely destroyed for over a year after after that, trying to get somebody to actually say, "Hey, yeah, I'm hurt." And when I finally had my surgery and like a month or so of basically being drugged up with painkillers because it was so bad when I finally got the the brace off and everything like that they turned around and sent me back to Iraq again like I, I walked in on crutches and, and I went back again and then I saw people around me getting promoted and then, you know, you started with the drawdown. It's like, oh, we want all these CBs, but then when we got all these CBs, it doesn't matter um, because the Navy has to, to downsize. And they, the CBs downsize faster than anybody. And, but at the same time, everybody requesting for more of us. So you had guys that were just going back to back to back and then all these other people that were saying, and at the same time, I, I went... I went 10 years with pass not advance for chief and a lot of it was because they said I didn't have my SKUs pin but the SKUs pin was a CB combat warfare pin designating that you were qualified to do combat which I kept doing combat stuff I kept doing everything and, and or had done everything that was required of this made up test to prove your skills. <laughs> and at, at the end of the day I never made chief and, and maybe thank goodness and I, I was told a lot and I've still been told to this day that you didn't really retire from the Navy because you, you never made chief and at that point I, I didn't see too many chiefs in the Navy that um, were showing me that everything that I had done was because of the guy that was before me or the guy that was next to me. I, I owed everything I had to everybody around me and to God. And when it was all said and done, when I retired from the military, and this is after you know going to war a couple more times and in, and in the Afghanistan, that it didn't matter anymore about what I was doing it only mattered about what looked good to the, to the higher ups you know you know and I always I always had awesome range scores I always had as good as PT as I could being that I was injured for the majority of my last 10 years in the military and I was still fighting to stay in I was still fighting to get my retirement and um The biggest thing is, I was a newly frocked first, amazing evals. They downplayed all that stuff, and then we have this award in the CBs. It was called the Marvin J. Shields Award, and, and it's given out to an outstanding, outstanding non-chief petty officer who showed exemplary drive and all these things in the military and basically you got chief off of that you know pass pass go go through jail whatever it is you got the ticket to, to becoming a chief and it was many years later and I was in the CB museum and I was watching they have the whole a bunch of the pictures of all the people that had received the, the the Marvin J Shields award and there was this um 
the same guy that was on deployment but was not in the same place as us. And I was reading his write-up for the Marvin J. Shields Award. And not too long after that, I went and looked at my eval because his eval, his write-up for that award was other than a couple other things that, you know, I, as a, a equipment operator, not a, a utilities man like he was, he, they used my eval from that deployment as his basic write-up so he can get the Marvin J. Shields Award. And, hey, it is what it is. I, I, I didn't make any ways because, hey, I had other things to do, like keep my family together. I was going through a divorce at the time. Um, didn't get to see my kids hardly at all. 9-11 was like a drop-off, and I just I just push, 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 push. And um, I did this all while being injured, being depressed as hell, and uh, not having God. And um, even though he was there with me the whole time, and I see this thing now when everything starts to clear and you start looking back on the things that happened how our military has changed but at the same time most of the people there are just there to fight the battle for the guy next to them and try to come out alive and with a little bit of dignity and um there's a lot of people out there that have had that that valor that they had shown that that love for the guy next to them that hard work that always pushing forward no matter how terrible things were getting around you and how terrible things had gotten back in the, in the home you know a lot of lost marriages, a lot of lost lives. And for what? And there's a lot of stolen valor out there. And I see it now, even in the ranks of the SEALs, and I, I see it a lot with people out there making all this money off of basically off the backs of guys that really were out there trying to make a difference and there's still a lot of really good men out there that are lost that haven't come home yet even though they're home they're not they haven't come home they're not safe and I, I would say I'm not all the way there either but hey it doesn't matter about me it matters about the guys that are out there in the streets the guys that are killing themselves for just a little bit of appreciation for what they did for so many others. And um, I just want, I want everybody to start like manning up and hey, do what you can, know what you did and realize that it was enough and there are us there are a lot of us out there that care and are looking for giving credit to where credit is due and it doesn't matter if you were a special operator or all that stuff like that why should that make any difference about why these guys are making all this money on the outside and making movies about them and stuff like that and where is all that money going to it sure as hell isn't going to help in any any vets out there. The guys that really are messed up in the head because of the shit they went through. And then they got just thrown aside because of some numbers. Because we need to downsize something. You're spending all this money, blah, 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 blah. Who really lost at the end of it? Because we still had all this equipment coming and all this gear and all these people saying we need our we don't want our kids dying in this war and rightly so we probably shouldn't have been over there dying in that war but you know where that money went to it went to the line the pockets of people that were taking credit for our valor our dedication 
are suffering. And it didn't help out. It didn't help out anybody just to get rid of some all these people in the military and downsize it and then make the people that got lucky enough, if you could call that luck, to stay in the military to just have their shit just trampled on. And um, it didn't save anybody money and it sure as heck isn't helping anybody's lives. So if you're out there and hopefully somebody hears this and you might call me jealous and all that stuff but I ain't got the pot to piss in but hey I'm happy and somewhat straightened out in my life but only because of Jesus and only because of God and now it's time to start showing other people hey it's they need to come home the war is over there will always be another war but that war is over. They need to come home. And first and foremost, us as brothers and sisters in the military, we need to help them do that. We, there's no way that we should be making more money than we could possibly imagine and not doing more, not just by giving money and saying that you're supporting the truth, but actually making a difference because there's a lot of pieces out there and there's a lot of people saying they're helping but there isn't a lot of help being seen so I'm not angry um, but I am angry and it's because I see it just the way a lot of other guys see it is we feel like no one gives a crap about us and as though we're not looking for a movie to be made about us or any recognition or money thrown at us. We just want some help and to realize that maybe somebody appreciates the hard work and sacrifice and suffering that we had to go through to fight a war just so somebody else could line their pockets. So, check yourself and try to make a difference and um, let's welcome some of these boys home and some of these girls too and there's a lot of families that um, have suffered because of all the stuff that has happened to these men and women and at the end of the day we need to do more and we need more people coming out and calling it for what it is and it's just stolen valor and um, I'm sorry for such a long video, but hey, we all matter. Every single one of us. We are all God's children. And if you think that you're better or you deserve all that money and fame and stuff like that, know that there's a lot of us out here that know if you didn't do it, believe me, we'll figure it out that you didn't do it. And that's what's happening. So, let's welcome some people home. Fear is a liar. You no longer have to be afraid of this war anymore. You no longer have to live in the past. Let's bring some of these boys home. May God bless us all. One love, one race under him. That's the human race for all you non-believers out there. Our lives matter. And Jesus' life mattered. Jesus loves you yesterday, today, and for all of eternity. So let's figure it out and make it a world where these boys can come home again. And make it a world where our children can grow up not thinking that all these rich movie hype people are the ones that we need to follow and we just need to follow in real men and women have a good day god bless